Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor for me to be part of such a dynamic group. I mean, once I'm invited, I've checked all the internet website and I see that there's uh, an activity going on here. So this, uh, then this also shapes my uh, speech as well. Uh, because I've seen in the program that there are many experts like uh, Julia as well, and uh, many of you knew the region, Syria region, very well. So uh, I decided to uh, ex talk about uh, one, how my, one migration story is interrelated with another one, and uh, how all these political, social, and economic, and cultural uh, relations within the countries are interrelated uh, in, uh, as a cause and a result of uh, migrants' destination. So, um, and I know that you invited me as a part of an uh, expert on the issue. I mean, and yes, I am. I did my PhD on everyday uh, practices of the internally displaced Kurdish man at the center of Istanbul. So migration, specifically internally displacement, is uh, my expertise. Yet uh, here, I am uh, not only expert on migration issues, I mean, but I'm going to talk about uh, my <coughs> own uh, academic exile story as a first-hand uh, experience as well. Uh, my migration story is an exiled academic uh, story as an exiled academic started when uh, I signed uh, the peace petition with uh, 1,128 of my colleagues uh, and the petition called uh, we will not be part of this crime. We've signed the petition on uh, January 11th uh, on 2016, uh, almost uh, a half year, six months before the famous coup attempt uh, happened in Turkey in July, you know, uh, 2016. And in less than a month's time, in February, I was fired from my position uh, as the head of the sociology department at Nishantash Univers University in Turkey. And immediately, I was lucky enough uh, to be invited to one of the professors at Humboldt University to apply to Philip Schwartz's uh, fellowship, and uh, I ended up here. Uh, so me and many of uh, our uh, my colleagues are targeted, and um, why, I mean, this becomes such an issue in Turkey? Because Academics for Peace uh, petition urged the Turkish government uh, to halt its accelerating violence in the Kurdish provinces and to return to stealth peace negotiations with the Kurds, act in conformity with national and international law. And this was, this was the first time that the sizable group of academics uh, of Kurdish and non-Kurdish uh, backgrounds for, from Turkey uh, had come together in solidarity to make concrete demands on politically taboo subject uh, of Turkish state violence towards the Kurds. With this petition, of course, as you can imagine, uh, we become the target of President Erdogan. He re reacted immediately by criminalizing this petition and petitioners. He accused the signatories of treason and making uh, of uh, and of making terrorist propaganda and announced the launch of a criminal investigation against all of us. The reaction of the Turkish state uh, was immediate and much more heavy-handed than most of the signatories expected, dubbing, uh, du dubbing the signatories fifth column terrorists and accusing them for being the traitors, uh, co uh, colonialists, and pseudo intellectuals. President Erdogan and the ruling elite denounced the, uh, the group in media. A mafia leader uh, even joined this uh, stigmatization process and, um, uh, and who, who also uh, has elicited ties to the state openly threatened the academics that he would take a shower uh, in their blood. And uh, so rather than uh, put a halt um, uh, the, and rather than put a halt to petition, these actions resulted in over 1,000 petitioners being added within a week, and the number of the uh, signatories climbed into 2,212. So we see that, I mean, on the one hand, we see what's going on in Turkey now. I mean, that it becomes, I mean, uh, much, much more, I mean, a centralized uh, a, a, a state without any, uh, a presidential state without any checks and balances, rule of power, but on the other hand, there was this urge and uh, courage to, to carry on peace process as well. Uh, but simultaneously, the Higher Council of Education, uh, the national institution that supervises all the universities in Turkey, began to ma take measures against academics for peace. Within a brief period, disciplinary and criminal investigations began, and hundreds of academics were suspended from their jobs. 
and few detained. Uh, in the aftermath of the state of emergency measures following the failed coup attempt on Ju July uh, 15, 2016, uh, thousands of signatories were banned from public s service and some put on trial on the basis of making uh, propaganda uh, uh, against uh, anti-Turkish propaganda against the state. Alongside academics for peace signatories, opposition politicians and groups, journalists, media workers, writers, and acad other academics were also purge purged. According to the latest report uh, from the Human Rights Joint Platform, 5,717 academics in Turkey have been removed from public service via the state emergency decree laws. And, and additionally, 3,041 academic staff formerly employed in private universities have lost their jobs due to forced university uh, closures. And the period after July 15th uh, also witnessed a purge not only in academia, but also in general. Within the failed coup attempt, uh, or, uh, attempt uh, Erdogan uh, moved to consolidate authoritarian power, mass disciplinary action by and against institutions, mainly the state institutions, but also private ones followed, resulting in the suspension criminal investigations and persecution, arrest and detention of many people. So anyone who is considered as opposition from leftist group to uh, Gülen movement circles have become the target of this huge purge and stigmatization. And uh, we have heard that, I mean, many of the migrants uh, also started to lose their lives uh, in Mediterranean, I mean, the migrants from Turkey, especially as a result of these decrees law, the, the decree laws, because once your name is decreed, uh, you don't have, uh, you cannot uh, move out, uh, lose your mobility outside of the country. You cannot move out. Plus, as one of the, um, I mean, some of the uh, ministers, but one specifically called, uh, that they uh, specifically uh, have the intention to, uh, uh, to, uh, to opposition to experience uh, civil death. So civil death means you cannot officially and unofficially find any jobs for a living. So the, 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 the Turkish migrants uh, included to this new uh, migrant move as well. Um, so this is how many academics, journalists, artists, and human rights activists ended up in many places all around the world, but Berlin has become one of the hub where they joined migrant groups from Syria to Ukraine, from Yemen to Afghanistan. And here's a gr growing number of political exiles, mostly academic journalists and artists, and this means that, I mean, they all ran away from v v various political persecution, and now they become the political, uh, I think, uh, and Berlin has also uh, provides the possibility to become a political critical hub, uh, hub and talk about the future of not only these ge geographies, are, I mean, the geographies that we come from, but also the, the geographies now we live in and all around the world, because we uh, more or less observe the similar pattern Look at US. I mean, so it's it's more or less the main uh, uh, the, the 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 common uh, mainstream tendency. So I mean, uh, okay, why did we become so important? I mean, frankly speaking, signing a petition for me is the lamest thing that I do in my life because uh, in, in Turkey, I mean, I did many critical research and I even I mean, some of my research become the headlines. I. Also, I mean, so I did academic research, but I'm quite active in the media. So signing a petition, why? Uh, I think it has also uh, political relations, and I cannot uh, uh, differentiate I'm mean, these interrelations with, with the Turkey's politics with Germany or the, uh, the war in going on in Syria. So that's how these all are interrelated. In June 7, 2015, a year before the coup attempt, elections uh, threatened Erdogan's uh, hold, power, uh, hold of power because the pro-Kurdish leftist umbrella party, HDP, passed the 10% uh, uh, threshold, which you can see the 10% threshold is a huge uh, pre uh, threshold for a democratic uh, country, and as a result of which the AKP lost its absolute majority in the parliament. Erdogan actively resisted from uh, forming a coalition government, and he realized that this would weaken his power. And therefore, in summer 2015, he started uh, heavily military operations with heavy and illegal curfews in the provinces where mainly Kurdish people reside. 
And unfortunately, the, the PKK's response to these heavy military state operations accelerated state violence while closing the space for political uh, actions. In the meantime, Europe preferred to turn blind eye, blind eye on the human rights violations both in the west and eastern part of Turkey, a so-called refugee issue crisis problem, which I'm also critical to the terminology, so that's why I'm using it in quotation, or the issue of protecting the borders of Europe uh, have become the primary concern, and it's just that during the heavy curfews of the Turkish state and Erdogan's canceling the relatively democratic elections on June 7th, to renew the elections on November 1st, Merkel decided to visit in the, uh, Erdogan uh, in his palace to give symbolic support. That was when Merkel and Erdogan started the negotiations for the famous refugee deal, which in effect pays Turkey money uh, for not letting Syrian refugees uh, reaching uh, Europe. In the renewed elections uh, on November 1st, uh, HDP still managed to pass the threshold, 10% threshold, but AKP's acceleration uh, of violence continued and expanded to other opposition groups. It was the moment that more than thousands of academics signed the petition. And in April 2016, the refugee deal was signed between Turkey and uh, Europe, as you uh, all know, and all the, uh, the, post the activities of the uh, NGOs also changed, I mean, in this region, which also uh, you underlined it while giving the numbers, uh, Julia. Thank you. So, I mean, now we are newcomers, new wave of diaspora in uh, Europe. And uh, at, in the opening speech, uh, Mark uh, mentioned about the Turkey's, uh, Turkish, I mean, uh, diaspora's existence here. Yes, Turkish diaspora came here as gastarbeiters in order to support the German economy during 1960s. Then, uh, you know, we are famous of, uh, Turkey is famous of having uh, coups. So, I mean, we, are, we used to be a country of uh, plurality in coups. So, we have many coups. So, in 1960s and uh, in 1980s, uh, with the effect of these coups, I mean, both leftist and uh, rightist oppositions uh, groups also ended in Turkey. And also, this gives another dynamic within the society, within the political activities of uh, the society as well. Uh, and now here we are, the new wave of diaspora around 2016, and especially uh, after the 2016 coup attempt. And, uh, and I, I can just say that, I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, the character of this new coup, uh, new, new uh, diaspora, is also quite heterogeneous. On the one hand, you listen to my stories, which looks more, I mean, left libertarian democratic you know uh, perspective but there are also other groups uh, from conservatives as i say one can be the gulen movement or can anybody who are affiliated to any group so it's once you become stigmatized um, you you which means that you you are under the threat of having the civil death and also uh, in 2014 after the Gezi uh, attempt uh, Erdogan uh, brought uh, a new, uh, made an amendment in the security and uh, communication law which uh, enables uh, people to spy on each other. It's the basic way of telling it. So my Syrian friends also uh, think that it's, it resembles like the Muhabarat. So it's like everybody, so which means that it's not only, the, it used to be when you have the coups, it used to be, okay, you and the state, you're in conflict with the state. But now, once you are stigmatized, you are also in conflict with the rest of the society. So this also increases the polarization and violence within the community. And also keep in mind that the opposition groups coming here are not are homogeneous, are not heterogeneous. So my encounters in Germany and Europe led me ask many questions. What are the encounters and how they uh, have been shaped in time? How does the previous diasporas themselves feel about their being in Germany? Have they identified themselves as a member of German societies? Uh, on purpose, I'm using it uh, in plural because I know that I mean it's very recent that Germany accepted itself as a society of migration, but it's not only Turks but other groups as well. And but what are their interrelations? We cannot make generalizations, of course, but if we uh, re-ask the question, what are their level of involvement in the society and the state bureaucracy? And most importantly, how many generations will take for migrants to become part of the society and regarded as German, 
Or was being migrant means always being a migrant? Was the concept and policy integration enough to moderate encounters with the newcomers, or it is more a one-way approach to migrants? I mean, I'm talking about mainly the application of it, or the people feel themselves. I'm just a question. These are the questions I raised during my exile experience. As a solution or the way forward, let me end with the recent events. I mean, the football player Özdi was highly criticized when he was taking photo with Erdogan. Was the same uh, similar criticism spoke out, spoken out when Merkel was taking photo with Erdogan in the undemocratic period of, in a very undemocratic pe and violent period of Turkey? And Özdi is criticizing German approach for being discriminatory or, or even racist, but. Did he also criticize the stigmatization and discrimination against a Turkish football, Kurdish, sorry, Kurdish football player uh, of one of the uh, Kurdish Turkish football teams in Ahmetspor? So what I believe is we can solve the miscommunication and mistranslation once we start to talk about not the identities but the issues. If one is against discrimination, he, she should be against for all discriminations. And if one feels the need to support democracy for her, his country, and society, he should, she should support it for all other countries and societies. I feel myself very lucky and privileged to be supported by German state and institutions. I'm, I'm grateful to many of the friends uh, there, but I know that not many other people are lucky as uh, I am. And I know that Germany is one of the countries that uh, founded many support programs and at national, local and national level. France and UK followed it. And uh, so there is an intellectual diaspora changes, both the, but I see that the composition of the migrant communities, and it has the potential to facilitate the new and highly productive academic, artistic, and literary encounters in European centers of knowledge production. So uh, such encounters in turn open up a new transnational productive thinking space in which will be the benefit of both home uh, of origin as well as the new settlement. So um, I'd like to uh, end my uh, speech by uh, telling that I mean uh, one last story, which also makes me think about my reflection about uh, my, my, my being, my feeling hope guilt and disappointment. On the one hand, I feel that I'm very lucky, but on the other hand, I know that when m new me media approach to us, uh, I feel very guilty and ashamed of being that privileged because I know that not other uh, people who wants to come here or migrate here have that, that uh, possibility. So which means that there is a selection in this process. So we should, okay, I'm the lucky one, but what about the rest? So I think this, should be something that we talk about. And uh, also, this is the guilt uh, thing, but on the other hand, I think really there is a hope if we manage to ask such questions which are not like to be asked uh, very often, we have the possibility to really think about the future and the new because this is the moment, I think, where we can do it. And we need to do it. Otherwise, we know what's going on uh, in the world uh, for in, in the name of democracy or other, I mean, notions. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I have a few questions, but they're very brief. Um, one would be, do you think the wave of exiled academics that have come here now are going to stay in Germany? Do they come with this idea of seeing long term? Or is it again just like we'll stay for a couple of years and then hopefully the political situation has calmed down and we can go back? Second question, you talked about the diversity of the Turkish community here now with all sorts of different political views. How do you experience it? Like how does the Turkish diaspora organize itself mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Germany? And very mm -hmm. last but not least, there was a news report that the new gen like the the Turkish young associate 60% with, Tur with Turkey hmm. and only 30% with Germany. How do you view that and why do you think mm -hmm. that is even though they've actually been okay. born and raised mm -hmm. in Germany? Can I? 
just want you something. I'm sure I'm going to forget your question, so let me start from the last one, but I think they are all valuable. Thank you. First, let me start with the last one. Uh, it's good to have such, because I mean, once I talk about such things, it's only my observation. I haven't reached, uh, I don't know the numbers, but of course, I, as a person focusing on migration, I also read a lot about I mean, this identification process, whether they people feel themselves or not. At the beginning, okay, it's said that, I mean, uh, it's Turkish diaspora's problem, that they feel that they're, they, they're one day they uh, went back, and also German state's problem. But what I feel is uh, both sides, one way or another, don't feel that there is going to be a mutual interrelated, uh, how can, uh, interrelate, interrelation that to uh, benefit from each other. So wh why, what I mean, I mean, it's what I observe, and as far as I talk with the people, I feel that it's more the integration process only uh, works one way. Like you need to learn the, uh, the 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 language, but sometimes I mean, living in an international environment doesn't mean the language, but how we live together. But of course, it's good to learn a language. I'm not against it, but also learn the lifestyle. But what about the lifestyle of the others? If if you are going to be an intercultural community. There should be a double way of learning, and it's not taking the food of it. It's just, you know, very uh, nail the brill and final way of, you know, in Turkey, we also like to pick the Kurdish food, but we don't talk about much about the genocide. Get what I mean? So it's like taking the food part, but what about the other discrimination? So that's why I think there is this lack of belonging. And Turkey and Erdogan, I mean, uh, if you look at, of course, it's a huge other uh, story, but if you look at the periods of the Erdogan, I mean, I've never ever voted myself uh, for right-wing uh, parties. I'm, I'm very open to it, but, but still I supported many uh, activities or many decisions Erdogan took. For instance, I mean, he opened the court cases against the coup generals. This is what we needed for democracy. So. At the beginning, he started with this democratic view, and it was a moment where he managed to build close relationship with the communities here. And also, there is this active state institution, many state institutions in Germany, like DITIP, you know, the, the religious affairs. So, I mean, one way or another, it's a state institution that you allow it to be your part of, the se se of, of yourself. And once the state's politics change, so it's not an independent institution, it also, the, 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 its perspective changes as well. So it has many, many uh, half sides to explain it. And you said, uh, the, the, the second one is, you go you back. How organize yourselves here? Huh, we organize ourselves here. First of all, I'd like, to, and I'd like to combine this with the first question. How do I feel? Um, I cannot talk on behalf of my friend, but I know that many of us are, have already been international scholars. And as around 2000s, Turkey was a very international and free hub that we really wanted to go back there, uh, there. And now I find myself very naive, but we really believe that. There is going to be a democratization process and we are going to actively take part in it. And we started to work on it. So many academics, so that's, that's the end result of that thousands and even two thousands of academics signed. Can you imagine how Egoistic can be an academic be, you know, an arrogant. I mean, we signed a petition, thousands of so, which means that we start, people started to take action. So we, we experienced this. That's why we turned to Turkey. Otherwise, I mean, many of us can survive elsewhere. But what I think is, uh, you, you can never know what's going on in Turkey, but I, I think in 10 years' time, uh, we will not be able to go back to our home country because, oh, I will see, because I mean, the, 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 the damage that is given, uh, not only that the state changes, but as the polarization that I mentioned to you, also increases stigmatization among people. So your everyday life influence as well. So it's not only being part of the academia, but what are you going to eat? Or uh, when you get you know, uh, death threats, how can you survive? So in this respect, unfortunately, uh, but as I say, I mean, many of us are international scholars, so we joined the club. I mean, without, I mean, realize that once we were naive to change the, the, the system, but now I think we are going to be part of it. And now here we organize, I mean, we have, uh, P Academics for Peace have, uh, I can only talk about this Academics for Peace and more leftist or let's say democratic circle. I don't want to call anybody undemocratic, but more or less leftist circles. 
Academics for Peace uh, found an association now, uh, and we work, try to work on, uh, develop projects on uh, peace, and also carry on the solidarity with our friends, because we also think that, I mean, uh, in Turkey there is also many, there are many academics who cannot go out, so think about, I mean, there is a huge capacity who can do research there, and they're in the site. So we try to, you know, provide this connection to, 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 keep, to, be, to carry on the, this transnational knowledge, uh, transference. And uh, secondly, there is Off University. Off University is an uh, online university uh, attempt, let's say. I mean, uh, we now have um, some teachers in Turkey, but they are giving le lectures in Postam University, and the students get credit. Now we started with the Turkish intellectuals and academics, but what we have in mind, and what I always have in mind, not only think within and about Turkey, but about what create this, this, I mean, or uh, widen this, this uh, circle by in, uh, including other uh, migrant communities. So these are the two that comes into my mind, but there are other activities I'm sure going on too. But these are the two concrete ones that I'm also actively taking part. Yes, please. I'm, sorry. I'm actually interested about what the actual petition's goal was. What was the inside of that petition? Uh, since according to what I know, uh, Erdogan was the first president that acknowledged the issue of the Kurds. Of course, uh, it was the other parties that were denying this issue. So he was the first president to embrace this issue. He was the first president to exactly the Erbaka. So was there uh, so urgent a need to sign this petition, and what was the, uh, you understand the question? Very well. <laughs> He's not the first one, the second one, there was Turgut Özal, uh, I mean, who's, but of course, and there's a suspicion still goes on that uh, the, 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 the death of the, the former, one of the former presidents, Turgut Özal, was uh, not natural death, but uh, murder, because I mean, he also had in mind to do something about something peaceful with Kurds. So, Kurdish issue is a very hot and dangerous issue for uh, Turkish politics, that's for sure. And you're right, it's Erdogan who managed to, uh, um, who started this uh, issue and negotiations. But also, I mean, in, as I s said before, I mean, there are periods in the, in the Turkish, I mean, in Erdogan's, you know, political turn. So, I mean, we started the Turkish I mean, Erdogan period full of life, hope, and democracy. And we ended with full of debt, oppression, and uh, you can count on. So that's why, I mean, once he realized that, he has the chance, but I don't know, of course, the, the real intention. Some say, the Kemalist says that from the very beginning he knows he wanted, that's why you never know, because you should act according to the changing politics, you know, um, and you, what you observe. Uh, but at the beginning, uh, it was uh, very beneficial for him to create the peace process. First, I mean, you're not going to have war, and secondly, uh, you're going to win the votes there. But unfortunately, I mean, um, the opposition leader, uh, HDP's leader, uh, Selahattin Demirtas, openly uh, declared that he didn't, his, he would fight against changing the system from parliamentarian to presidential, to openly to, 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 to Erdogan's you know, face, and it, it becomes a part of the campaign. And secondly, the war going on Syria, we shouldn't underestimate it because we know that, I mean, the YPG uh, groups, I mean, who are fighting against ISIS, basically, uh, are also part of, I mean, I cannot say that they are directly related with the Tur Kurdish uh, PKK, but more or less they have, you know, many relations. We know that because many of the, you know, uh, people, I mean, dying, I, come, I mean, their bodies were taken, uh, brought back to, to be buried in their homeland, which means that there is this Turkish connection. And Turkey's tone was, mm, and also why, you know why Can Dündar, the journalist, was here? Because he reported on Turkish trucks supported ISIS as well. So that's why this, all these political relations, you know, the, the, the dynamic, decided Erdogan to turn its face uh, from peace to, from life to death, that's what I say. Because in a day's time, I mean, the deaths were stopped. 
but we also observed, I mean, 80 people, how 80 people were burnt alive in one of the basement in Jizra as well. And this is, this is how the 2015 and 16 goes, and it, this was the moment that we, who studied, I mean, democratization on Turkey, Kurdish issue, decided to sign this petition and call the state to stop violence and obey the international and national law. We, there's no word for PKK because we don't even agree on the same thing about, we don't think the same thing on PKK as well. Get what I mean? I, I hope I can give the short answers, uh, but these are very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, one is when it comes to, to citizenship, or especially the German Turkish double citizenship, there was always this, this argument about the conflict in Conflict in? Import. The Turkish, like the Kurdish-Turkish conflict imported from Turkey to Germany. And I want to ask you, do you have any impressions about the Turkish-Kurdish conflict in Germany? Hmm. And the second question I got is, um, during the election, um, the recent election, a lot of Kurds voted for the uh, AKP um, because of several groups. Because of what reasons? Because of several reasons. Uh -huh, several, so yes. And I just wanted to ask you, what do you think are the reasons for this? Uh, it's also another complicated and big question. First of all, in regarding Germany, uh, and you ask the voting thing in Germany or in? In Turkey. In Turkey, okay. Uh, so let's start then the voting thing in Turkey. I mean, uh, first things first, I think people uh, in eastern part, I mean, the, in the Kurdish provinces, really fed up by the war, and also, uh, the, the, and, and that's why, I mean, but they still are after peace, and I think that they really mainly and support, when you look at the numbers, HTP. But also, uh, we should keep in mind that, I mean, there was a huge pressure. I think the elections were won by the, uh, by the AKP before the elections, because they changed the place of the election spots and they make the, the, the mobility of the people to go to election places very insecure and also even in Suruç where you know in 2015 or 16 where you know uh, there was a group of young people socialist people who were taking you know toys to the kids in Rojava and there was an explosion and many of them died you know in this place there uh, a, a, a brother of an AKP MP and their relatives uh, first uh, shot uh, one of the, you know, uh, craftsmen uh, because as they declared that we are for HTP and this group carry on and shot one in, at, in, in their uh, store and then carry on, uh, uh, carried on, I mean, going to, to the hospital and killed many, of, three of the other relatives with brutally and police did nothing. So that's why people don't feel secure there as well and you do you feel that there's no one and and now it was the family who forced to leave from Suruç the, the family who lost their members but it was not the state you know I mean the, the, and the still the the the, the gun uh, the gunman is still free so in this atmosphere uh, I don't think that it was the change of the numbers but it was the oppression and the pressure that really changed the figures but still HTP managed to pass the threshold, and it was real, mainly the Kurdish votes. And regarding here, um, what I observe, uh, of course, many of you know much better than I do because I'm a newcomer, and I have very general observations. But what I uh, feel is Europe's changing politics also influenced Kurdish and, and Turkish communities relations as well. One thing, I was invited to European Parliament to give a speech on academic and exiles. And by one of the Romanian MP, there is no way that you could have asked me this question without being lobbied by a Turkish state, openly asked me with the content of the petition and said that, is PKK a terrorist organization? Give me that answer. It's like, the, you know, the prosecutor of Turkey, you know, it's just, and in the European Parliament, Without, I mean, and we talk that, I mean, and the, the, the petition, you can reach it. There is no one word of violence or support to any group. Just call the state because I'm a citizen. Of course, I have the right to talk legally with the state, not with any other organizations, and I can talk about its actions, okay? But the way this MP 
I mean, acts to me. And when I th think about how one of the HTP offices was ra ra raided, rather by by uh, German uh, police, I mean, very brutally, and they did they found nothing but the legal, you know, documents and the brochures of the HTP. Just gives me the feeling that now the Kurdish issue becomes another hot issue, where many people are are I think set their dice. So that's why I think that the tension they have also in, uh, interferes the relationship within the groups uh, in the society. That's my feeling. Uh, but of course, I mean, you, you, many of you, I don't know your stories, but I think you have much more detailed and well-informed knowledge, but that's what I observed and experienced in the parliament. All of a sudden, we become like a terrorist academics, you know? But like Turkish state did, so. Okay, thank you for the questions.